thank you very much to all the attendees that are there in the web to this e-seminar co-organized by the Ericam and the Diabetes, two of the working groups of the ERA, the European Renal Association, who is behind of these activities. And uh, we are Matt Hornum, the speaker, and myself, members of the Diabetes Working Group, and two panelists from the Eurecam Working Group. Um, now we will hear some hints about uh, one of the new drugs that are changing this uh, the world of diabetes uh, and diabetic nephropathy and disease in the context of obesity. Let me introduce the speaker, Matt Holman, who has been a member of the Diabetes Working Group for a long time. He's a nephrologist, uh, a researcher, and a professor of the University of Copenhagen. So, Matt, uh, thank you very much for giving this talk. Uh, you can start what you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mats Hornum. I'm a professor in nephrology, as, uh, as Esteban told. I'm past president of Diabetes and now uh, working uh, alongside the, the Diabetes board with a lot of uh, interesting studies that I I hope to to give you some insight in uh, and to to share some ideas with you uh, in the end of this uh, presentation. Um, we uh, decided to to give this talk uh, with the heading GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, in patients with CKD, not on, on dialysis, uh, beyond cardiac renal uh, uh, protection. I have uh, the disclosure that I am in, I am an investigator in the remodel study sponsored by Novo Nordisk. Otherwise, I have uh, nothing to disclose within the past twelve months relevant to this presentation, and I do do not uh, include discussion of up label or investigator use of drugs, and I do not intend to reference unlabeled, unapproved uh, uh, use of drugs or products in my presentation. So. Um, to start with, uh, uh, I will go through this agenda. Uh, I will talk about incretin effect and impaired uh, kidney function. Um, I will talk about uh, incretins and the kidney, use of incretin therapy in CKD, new studies uh, of the use of incretin therapy in CKD. And, and finally, uh, I will uh, demonstrate new ways to discuss uh, and study kidney uh, tissue. Uh, what is impaired uh, incretin effect? Um, we have seen in studies uh, previously performed in our laboratory that uh, there is an, a, a huge amount of impaired glucose metabolism and uh, incretin effect in uremic patients. We also uh, have performed a lot of uh, studies on the beta cells capacity, uh, and this also seems to be affected by uh, uremia. If you if you uh, see these uh, three curves, you see the glucose uh, of uh, measurements of uh, 180 minutes uh, glucose uh, uh, test performed either by ingesting glucose, the OGTT, or by uh, uh, giving uh, glucose as infusion, the IIGI. In healthy controls, this has a very classical uh, uh, appearance. And if you do uh, the uh, same uh, tests in end stage renal disease patients with normal glucose tolerance, it's uh, pretty much similar. If you do it in end stage renal disease patients with impaired glucose tolerance tests, you see this uh, rather uh, a slower uh, uh, descent and decrease of, uh, of glucose. Um, and if you then perform the measurements of insulin uh, together with the measurements of glucose, you see uh, in the first the healthy control group a very rapid uh, increase in insulin. And in the end stage renal disease patients uh, with normal glucose tolerance, an almost similar increase of uh, insulin uh, secretion. However, in the impaired uh, glucose tolerant uh, test uh, patients with end stage renal disease, you see a very uh, decreased uh, increase in insulin. If you then uh, take the uh, AOC of insulin uh, in the OTTT and subtract the AOC of the insulin uh, secretion uh, with the IIGI, 
and divided by the AIC of insulin uh, performed by the OTTT, you have the increasing effect. So uh, in, in percent, this is 69% uh, of the insulin secretion that actually is uh, 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 caused by the uh, incretin effect uh, uh, when you uh, in, in secrete insulin uh, in an oral glucose tolerance test in a normal healthy uh, patient or person. And as you can see, this decreases alongside uh, the uh, level of uh, glucose tolerance you have and uremia you, you have. And in, in impaired glucose tolerant patients, the incretin effect is uh, decreased to 41%. So uh, impaired incretin effect does exist in end-stage kidney disease, as we would also expect. Um, fasting levels of GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon are significantly increased in non-diabetic dialysis patients. And this is uh, uh, primarily due to the, uh, uh, the decreased uh, kidney function, but also to the uremia itself. Glucagon seems irrepressible in dialysis patients, a phenomenon that we have studied intensively and a, a problem that is uh, contributing to the uh, disease state of uh, type 2 diabetes in uh, dialysis patients. The incretin hormones, however, respond in a similar manner in non-diabetic dialysis patients and healthy subjects. Uh, and, and one of the other very important things is that uh, we have evidence to uh, suggest that the degradation and the elimination of intact and N-terminal truncated metabolites of GLP-1 and, and GIP respectively are delayed, but relatively preserved in patients with end-stage renal disease. And this means that the GPP-4 uh, mediated degradation of the in intact hormones seems unaffected by severe uremia. And there seems to be a non-renal degradation and elimination of the incretin metabolites. And this uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 makes us uh, a little bit relieved because we then are uh, allowed to use these drugs in our patients with very severely reduced renal function. Uh, so, I will now uh, go further to uh, 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 looking at the kidney specific uh, uh, because we we have seen that there are uh, renal protective effects of GLP ones in uh, in animal studies uh, to begin. With. It was studied uh, in mice and rats, and it was shown that there were significantly uh, uh, effects of GLP one receptor agonists and GLP four inhibitors. Uh, uh, because it was shown that they have protective roles in reducing proteinuria, reducing uh, sclerosis and glomeruli, and uh, this was uh, associated with protection from endothelial injury and reduction in oxidative stress and inflammation. And um, this uh, study by Pike and, and colleagues showed that GLP-1 receptor was exclusively uh, expressed in smooth muscle cells in the walls of arteries and arterioles, and summarized in this uh, 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 in this uh, review uh, that uh, there was also a kidney uh, expression of GLP-1 receptors uh, in uh, other cells uh, in the kidney, uh, including uh, glomerular cells and tubular cells. So cumulative evidence uh, from functional and uh, histological studies uh, support a role of, inc of, of renal incretin uh, uh, peptides in modulation of uh, sodium and water homeostasis. Um, and this uh, effect of the kidneys have uh, shown uh, promise in, uh, in several large uh, studies uh, by uh, GLP-1 agonists. So uh, I will now turn on to the to the principle of the incretin uh, therapy in CKD and and some new exciting studies. So the, the potential of the GLP one uh, is is primarily uh, uh, mediated by two uh, uh, elements. 
by uh, having a DP4 resistant analog of GLP1, you raise the agonist plasma concentration into the pharmacological range. And by inhibiting uh, the DP4 activity, you prevent the degradation of the endogen release incretin hormone and you enhance plasma levels of the active peptides. So what is the potential mechanisms then behind the possi possi possible uh, renoprotective effect of GLP-1 uh, favoring uh, CKD patients? Well, firstly, uh, uh, the secondary indirect effects are uh, a, a modest uh, effect on the systolic uh, blood pressure. Um, and you also see uh, a slightly uh, increase in, uh, in pulse. Uh, you see the HbA1c reduction, and you see a, a weight loss that is uh, uh, dose-dependent. You also see effects on uh, lipids. And um, this uh, is thought to, to occur on the basis of a hemodynamic effect in the kidney, a reduced interglomerular pressure, a modulation of the renin angiotensin system, a diuretic natiuretic effect, an anti-inflammatory effect, and the reduced oxidative stress and reduced endothelial dysfunction. Uh, to, to be uh, concrete, uh, if uh, you have a patient that needs a glucose lowering therapy with diabetes and CKD, CADIGO uh, guidelines uh, uh, recommend that if the patients who have not achieved individual glycemic target despite use of metformin and SGLE2 inhibitor treatment and who are unable to use those medications or are unable to use those medications, they recommend a long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist. And this uh, 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 is able, this is uh, uh, done by several uh, agents um, and some of them uh, are uh, to be uh, dose uh, re reduced uh, and used with uh, caution with low GFR, and, and some of them uh, are with no dosage uh, adjustment, but with limited uh, data with low GFR. This is important uh, glucose uh, uh, lowering uh, practice points uh, when you want to use this uh, drug, because the choice of a GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, should be uh, directed against a documented, documented cardiovascular uh, protection. And the, the other point to be aware of is to minimize gastrointestinal side effects, such as nausea. Uh, and by doing this, uh, you need to start with a low dose of the uh, drug and to titrate it slowly. You should also be aware not to use GLP-1 receptor agonist in combination with a DPP-4 inhibitor. The risk of hyperglycemia is generally low with GLP-1 receptor agonist when used alone. However, uh, if you use it uh, in a combination with other medications such as supernurias or insulin, it needs to be uh, reduced, uh, the other uh, drugs, sulfonuria or insulin, and this also points to the uh, attention that you need to be uh, aware of not using it in uh, type 1 diabetes patients. And finally, if you want to uh, use it, uh, you can preferably use it in patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes and CKD to promote an intentional uh, weight loss. Some of the new studies that we, uh, we will talk about now is the uh, flow study which is uh, a semaglutate once weekly study uh, versus uh, placebo on top of, uh, of uh, standard of care in patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD and the remodel study, which is in 105 patients. Uh, uh, a one-year study, uh, the remodel study and the flow study is, uh, is uh, intended to, to last for five years. We will first uh, look at the flow study the flow study uh, is uh, designed to uh, see uh, what the potential kidney protective effect of GLP-1 receptor agonist is in type 2 diabetes patients. It is dedicated to a kidney outcome uh, and um, the patients are population with CKD and type 2 diabetes at high risk of kidney disease progression. Uh, the group has an ETFR of 
50 to uh, 75 milliliters per minute, and then UACR for of 300 or up to 5,000 milligrams per gram, or a GFR between 25 and 50 milliliters per minute, and it was out of uh, above 100 to 5,000 milligrams. And the endpoint is the time to the first occurrence of kidney failure, of persistent 50% uh, reduction in EGFR or kidney uh, death or cardiovascular uh, death. The study has been uh, has been uh, running now since 2019 and the results are expected in 2024. 80%, 80, 80, 68% of the patients are at very high risk for CKD progression with an EGFR in areas of 47 minutes per minute and a median USR of 568 milligrams per gram. And uh, interestingly, 15.5% of the patient population at baseline were receiving SGLT2 inhibitors. So this study, uh, uh, we look very much forward to see uh, the results of, especially because uh, it has a, a renal uh, uh, composite primary uh, endpoint. Another study uh, that we uh, also participate in is the uh, remodel study. That is a mechanistic uh, trial to uh, evaluate the effects of semaglutides on the kidney in people with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And the patients here should have a GFR between 40 and 75 millions per minute and, and a, a USR as low as 30 and up to 5,000 5, milligrams per gram. And they should have uh, type 2 diabetes and was uh, also uh, not uh, well, was also uh, in stable uh, RAS inhibitor uh, treatment. Uh, what is interesting, especially about the study, is that a, a part of the study has performed uh, uh, kidney biopsies uh, at the beginning um, to uh, assess uh, kidney uh, tissue. Um, from the beginning, and also uh, they have performed uh, MRI uh, to see uh, what uh, the uh, specific uh, changes in several parameters that I will come back to is at the beginning and after uh, the uh, treatment of semaglutide for one year, uh, you will have the uh, two uh, examinations performed again, that is a kidney biopsy after one year and an MRI after one year. 24 hour urine and uh, first morning urine uh, is performed regularly throughout the, the trial. The MRI is interesting also in this study because uh, uh, the intention is to, to, to examine the renal oxygenation uh, to start with and after uh, one year. Um, also, uh, it is, uh, it, oh, sorry, it is a uh, uh, plan that we want to uh, uh, investigate inflammation, interstitial uh, fibrosis, and also uh, kidney flow. And finally, there will be a single cell gene expression profile data that will be able to be analyzed in these, uh, in these uh, uh, patients uh, before and after treatment uh, by the histology data that is uh, achieved by the uh, biopsies. So uh, now I will go to the uh, last part of my uh, talk, which is uh, uh, a study that we perform in our diabetes uh, working group uh, uh, through the European Nephrectomy uh, Biobank. The Nephrectomy uh, Biobank is called MBIBA. And first I will present the studies of uh, type two diabetes patients uh, that we have performed. Uh, the uh, Biobank is uh, using the unaffected tissue from nephrectomy. Uh, Pre-nephrectomy patients are characterized uh, metabolically and put into a database. And post-nephrectomy, the, uh, the, the samples of the uh, kidneys uh, away from the tumor is embedded in the paraffin and analyzed at Hospital Universario de Tenerife in Spain. Four groups are created based on the metabolic profile, a normal group, a metabolic syndrome group, a type 2 diabetes group without prosinuria, 
and a type 2 diabetes group with proteinuria. This is uh, the uh, samples that they appear in the in the paraffin uh, slice. And uh, the patients are to be above 18 years. They are giving uh, informed consent and they are not allowed to have any kind of renal disease. Uh, and there has to be enough unaffected tissue uh, away from tumor and they will not be uh, allowed to have uh, a renal uh, transplantation. Uh, the reason for the first study was uh, to study uh, the uh, information about the clinical historical correlation in diabetic nephropathy. Um, and to do this, we analyzed nephrectomy uh, samples from 90 patients with diabetes and, and diverse degrees of proteinuria and glomerular filtration rate. We found that 40% had normal albinuria, 37% had microalbinuria, and 23% had non-nephrotic proteinuria. And each sample contained 170 glomeruli. Uh, and 82 and 90% of those with normal albinuria or microalbinuria were classified as diabetic nephropathy class 2A or 2B, and 10% uh, or less was in the class 3. As an overall uh, figure of these samples, moderate hyalinosis and arterial sclerosis were observed in 80 to 100% of cases with normal albinuria, microalbinuria, and proteinuria, as well as in classes one, two, and three. As you can see on this slide, uh, this is examples of the vascular lesions. Arterial hyalinosis was present in A, B, and C, and fibrointimulum thickening uh, in D, E, and F. And this was actually in patients with normal albinuria, the D uh, figure, the microalbinuria A, B, and E, or in the non-nephrotic non proteinuria, the C, E, and F. <clears throat> this is the uh, uh, publication. It was published in kidney interest and reports in 2021. And we concluded that we observed a lack of correspondence between kidney histology and analytical parameters in diabetes. And this indicates that disease may progress undetected from early clinical stages of the disease. And finally, vascular damage was a very, very common finding, <coughs> sorry, which highlights the role of the ischemic intrarenal disease in diabetic nephropathy. Um, at present, we are examining metabolic syndrome, which was one of the four groups that I started to show. And uh, this uh, group is uh, consisting of 165 patients. 160 patients have metabolic syndrome characterized by uh, older age, by uh, uh, a metabolic syndrome defined as BMI uh, above 27, impaired fats and glucose uh, in uh, a large part of the group, hypertension in 90% of the group, uh, dyslipidemia in 60% of the group, and cardiovascular events in uh, 24% of the group. The GFR of the two uh, groups are comparable, and the albuminuria uh, excretion uh, is uh, at the low levels, but uh, higher in the metabolic syndrome group. We then also looked at the glomerular uh, lesions, uh, and with a median of 165 uh, glomerular uh, per uh, sample, we found a significant uh, uh, higher uh, number of patients with global sclerosis in the metabolic syndrome group, a significantly higher number of nodular sclerosis, and a vascular lesion uh, degree that were significantly increased in the metabolic syndrome group. And this was, uh, on, uh, this was independent of uh, age in a multivariate analysis. These two figures show uh, the glomerular uh, area in the metabolic syndrome, which is uh, severely, uh, significantly increased compared to the controls. Uh, and also the mesangial area, which also was uh, significantly increased in the metabolic syndrome group control compared to the controls. When we looked at the uh, vascular lesions, we again found a huge amount of hyalinosis and arteriosclerosis in the 
in the uh, kidney samples. So uh, to conclude, uh, this this paper has uh, recently been been uh, submitted. Um, we were surprised by the huge uh, kidney histolytic uh, changes in the in the metabolic syndrome patients. And uh, given the fact that you don't uh, regularly uh, uh, biopsy these patients, this uh, uh, gave off uh, gave us uh, some thoughts on what uh, what to do with this uh, knowledge. So to uh, conclude, uh, uh, I will I will uh, end my talk by by asking uh, out in the in the panel and the audience with, with diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome and his renal histology, uh, could we uh, anticipate any effect of GLP-1? Uh, and uh, further on, uh, could we uh, anticipate an effect of dual uh, GIP, GLP-1 agonists on renal histology changes, if any? And finally, uh, what to expect from long-term effects of weight loss by GLP-1 agonists on renal function and histology? I think these uh, three uh, uh, questions are rather unanswered uh, at the present moment, but we uh, need to address them uh, in order to uh, uh, have new evidence and to order to maybe uh, use the potential of this uh, molecule. And then I will uh, end my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mats, for this comprehensive view of the problem and the, the topic of uh, the effect of these new drugs in patients with CKD. So now I will, I think uh, I will, the, the questions are open. I don't know if the panelists wants, want to start asking questions or we can ask directly, when directly to the, Charles, do you want to, Beatrice, please. If I can start, perhaps, if Beatrice allows me. Um, Mads, fantastic talk, really interesting, really interesting. Um, I've always been fascinated by the GLP-1 agonists, because actually they, they have very modest effects on HbA1c, for example, but massive effects on cardiovascular events, all relative to the changes in blood pressure and changes in sugar. And I, I was interesting um, that the, actually the GLP-1 receptors, particularly in the kidney, seem to be located on smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle. And you've shown with that fantastic study from, from the European Biobank that actually the major histological abnormalities, both in diabetic nephropathy and in metabolic syndrome, are actually vascular changes rather than the classical glomerular diabetic changes. And it makes me, me think more of diabetes as a vascular disease, more in the Eurocan field of things. And that the damage that the diabetes is doing to the kidney is being mediated via vascular damage, which then goes on to cause kidney damage and the direct effects of high blood sugars. Do, do you agree with that? Would you like to comment or do you, do you think I'm talking? Yeah, about we, we, we have uh, thought the same. Uh, we were uh, surprised and astonished about, uh, especially because we had the, the large uh, samples of, uh, of affected kidney tissue and, and no samples were without any uh, vessels. And uh, it was so obvious that uh, the vessels were damaged uh, in 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 pretty much all samples. Oh. Don't you agree, Esteban? Yes, yes, I I, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, the the point is that we're surprised a bit because we saw that. But if you think a bit, diabetes. These people with diabetes, also people with metabolic syndrome, have or die or suffer frequently because of cardiovascular events. So if you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke, if you're undergoing an amputation of a leg, means that your endothelium and vessels are wrong. And let's not forget that the kidney is highly irrigated. It's, it's, it's full of vessels everywhere. Why not this endothelium is supposed to be altered? Yeah. There, there's... There's something very nice in your in, in this paper, and it's about like these vascular lesions. They are coming 
whether if you've got macroalbuminuria, microalbuminuria, or normal albuminuria. So that's very important thing because sometimes we just go on to biopsy because we believe that the patient's got something different at our technopropathy or or some other lesions. And and sometimes we are not as a clinicians, we are not that aware. So okay, the patient's quite okay. HVA HV1C is fine. The patient's under metformin and and SCLT2 inhibitors and whatever, even if it's a little bit fat or whatever. And then we don't think about that these lesions can happen in every in every moment of the disease. So uh, as we do not biopsy this kind of patients, we do not know. And and this is a very important thing in 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 treating CKD because sometimes there, there's you know there's a difference when you're treating a patient whether the patient's got like a lot of like a macroalbuminuria or when the patient's got normal normal albuminuria and and this uh, biobank has shown us that uh, you can have normal albuminuria and you can have important vascular lesions and this is quite important I think. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, and the the safety studies, uh, the leader and the and the sustained studies showed that uh, you actually had a decrease in uh, in the rate of uh, of uh, of macro uh, uh, albuminuria uh, uh, in the two uh, in the two studies. Uh, and um, I think we need to we need to look uh, on this uh, on this molecule in in regard to our patients. As uh, protective, uh, not only in the, in the uh, by by measure of, of albuminuria, but also on the of the inter arena uh, uh, vessel uh, protection, um, and hopefully the the remodel study can show the, us uh, some evidence for this uh, mechanistic uh, view of of uh, the, the molecule. We will uh, see that. Um, and and about this uh, finally and, and anti-inflammatory pathways that we know some of them we know and some of them we really don't know. I would like you to talk about a little bit if you if you can about semaglutide and the last um, and the last uh, study uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine about heart failure, uh, preserved ejection fraction in heart failure, and they were talking about like uh, this. Uh, interesting uh, cardiovascular outcomes and 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 better um Kansas City uh, degree of 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 this uh, uh you know I don't remember the name this Kansas City uh, tech uh, in patients uh, with congestive heart failure using semaglutide or using DLP1 receptor agonist and decreasing um the C um uh, uh, CRP in this uh, patient, so there's a there's an anti-inflammatory pathway that coexists in all the metabolic syndrome, and in CKD patients can, you know, can be managed with this. Yeah, uh, and and, and 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 for 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 the for the reasons that we have uh, shown, uh, the patients, even those with uh, non proteinuric uh, diabetes, uh, they have uh, vascular lesions. Uh, I think. This this just uh, is uh, is a point to to remember uh, when we uh, uh, when we plan our treatment of the patients. Matt, there are some questions from the audience. I can share with, with you and the panelists. Uh, Abdelhamid Ramadan asks, how come GLP one receptor agonist decreases intraglomerular pressure? Yeah. That's a good uh, question. We we did addressed it in a NDT review some years some years ago, um, by Pantelis Sarafidis and, and uh, the two groups, uh, Dibistia and Erika, and um, uh, one of the uh, theories is, is that it reduces the it 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 it, it, uh, it uh, reduces the tubular glomerular feedback. So it uh, it works uh, by uh, by the natiuresis uh, reduction uh, to the same way as SGLT2 inhibitors to uh, reduce the SGLT2 uh, the sorry the tubular glomerular feedback uh, and by this uh, it has a reverse uh, uh, effect on the interglomerular pressure. This this sure. was the theory that we uh, at that time uh, uh, found most evidence for. 
Okay, there is Hidri Buba. What is the side? What are the side effects of GLP-1 plus gliptin? Well, uh, GLP-1 has the, the classical side effects of uh, nausea and uh, and uh, uh, diarrhea. Um, um, gliptin uh, in the in the type that uh, uh, used uh, uh, solo uh, because you should not use them together. Uh, has uh, very few side effects. Uh, so uh, the, the most side effects is seen with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and that is uh, nausea. Uh, uh, vomiting is also seen if you increase the dose too fast, and uh, diarrhea is also seen. Okay. So you said something, you said something very interesting about that increasing doses too fast, yeah, which exactly. is a very, very nice indeed, because sometimes when you go onto this... Uh, the slide is like, okay, I will go four weeks and four weeks and four weeks, but sometimes when you do that slow, you know, a little bit slower, uh, patients uh, can can go better. That, that was a very good point yeah, exactly. in clinical practice. Yeah, we actually treated uh, in a in placebo control study, we treated dialysis patients with glutide uh, and we titrated it extremely slowly. Um, and patients that they had a significantly increased the number of side effects, but they they managed to 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 stay on the drugs, and and the effects were were quite good. So so um, that was uh, something published in Diabetes Care in two thousand and sixteen. That was that was also a very good point about dialysis patients. Uh, can I ask you a question about this dialysis patients? And uh, are you are you treating your dialysis patients with uh, with GLP one receptor agonist? And do you titrate doses, or do you still like, get with the same doses as they had when they uh, started dialysis? Uh, because it's a good point. And in this incremental dialysis, I'm trying to get patients to transplantation. You know, there are a lot of people with problems of obesity problems that cannot be transplanted with safety, you know, with because of safety concerns. And I would love to know about that. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we do use it. Uh, we, also, we always have an individual uh, 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 assessment of the patient's uh, need and, and the patient's uh, um, motivation because uh, they they will have more side effects uh, being on dialysis. So you need to be going slow and going very uh, careful, um, but you are able to use, uh, for example, uh, a leukotide in uh, dialysis patients. Um, mm -hmm. But, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a individual assessed uh, uh, risk uh, assessment that you need to perform in, in each patient before you do it. You're right, it's very motivationally driven. So I, I use a lot of a GLP reception antagonists in my dialysis patients trying to get them on the transplant list to lose weight. And sometimes yeah, that's the adverse fair. effects are, are actually beneficial because they feel quite sick with it. And, and the weight just falls off them miraculously. And, and if they're motivated, they, tol they, they stick with it. They put up with the drug. Yeah. And there's several lives I think we've saved with GLP-1 antagonists just by getting them the weight down in dialysis patients and getting them on the yeah. list. Yeah. But yeah. you, you lose. Yeah, they, they can have some beneficial effects um, in terms of, of anti-inflammatory, you know, this anti-inflammation or this decreasing in inflammation, even if they are a lot of, they've got a lot of inflammation when they get to dialysis. So it can be like uh, a little bit better. Yeah. My, my experience outside of getting them the transplant is very negative because they all feel sick all the time, or a lot of the time. Yeah. As soon as they feel sick, the drug gets okay. and they come off it. And I can't persuade them, but if I persuade them to get on the to the transport list, it's amazing how much they tolerate big doses of rapid increments. Um, but well, otherwise, no. We can. We must give some also room for the for the questions for the audience that are more. For example, there is a question from Tron Jensen. Can you also relate in viva findings in the kidney to central obesity overweight rather to BMI isolated? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, thank you for that. Um, I uh, in my in, in the well in the in the in Beaver study so far we we divided the group. I think you divided it by the BMI twenty seven. Um, we haven't uh, data. Uh, not in in my 
uh, recall about central obesity um, okay. overweight. We do have it, but uh, yeah, we do have it, but uh, I'm not, I don't have the present data. Do you have that, Esteban? No, no. Uh, the, 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 the problem with this analysis is that uh, some centers uh, have data on the waist and hip, and some uh, it's not uh, it's not in all of the of the centers. No. And also regarding that, it's very difficult to separate the data on obesity from other aspects like hypertension and prediabetes and things. And uh, there is another question regarding. Uh, let's see. Can GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists affect other CKD medication as it decreases gastric NT? Yeah, that's a very good question and a very relevant question because uh, for, for, for many years uh, we have been uh, locked in uh, using it in, uh, in kidney transplanted patients simply because we were afraid of mm. delay graphic emptying. There has been some series uh, of uh, of measurement of uh, of uh, immune suppression following uh, GLP one agonist, and and actually there hasn't been any of the studies published that has been able to show that you actually um, have any concerns on the immune suppression. However, we need to see some safety studies. Uh, uh, a current study is going on at the Mayo Clinic with ex Exidin four. And, uh, and, and, and soon we will start a study with semaglutide in early post plant hyperglycemia. Uh, but it is a relevant concern. Uh, and you need to, as, as you, you should do in the early stages of kidney transplantation, to measure your immunosuppressive uh, levels if you, if you uh, uh, want to start this medication. And my advice is to start this medication late in transplantation, so not within the first three months. So, um, so you have to use insulin within the first three months, in, in my opinion. Uh, okay. We need some safety uh, studies. There is yeah, we, we, we need some safety studies, uh, but we've got some, some data about like immunosuppressants in, not in early, after early transplantation, but last time, like, like 12 months after transplantation. So they can start with GLP-1 receptor agonists. There are some studies using tacrolimus and, and it's quite safe. They have measured and, and some serious, as you said, there are series of patients. There are no like randomized control clinical trials or whatever. And but but this is quite okay, and this is not affecting a lot of uh, medications. But sometimes you you have to change the way you give. For example, if you're given oral a GLP one receptor agonist, that must be given in the morning. And if you're giving the tacrolimus, maybe retarded doses at evening. So changing this. But uh, there are some serious of patients uh, using tacrolimus and GLP-1 receptor agonists were quite uh, okay. The results are not that there are no differences between them. But again, need more patients, and and this is quite difficult in 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 in, in transplanted patients because as, as you said, sometimes we are very aware of that and we just go with the patient using like. Uh, like uh, insulin or, or, you know, some other medications uh, so as not to be affected. Well, there is another question from Neil Doherty, I imagine from Ireland, Dublin. The animal models typically focus on glomerulosclerosis and mesangial expansion rather than resistance vessels, hypertensive. It would be interesting to consider which animal model best matches metabolic syndrome associated with allistopathology, perhaps obese hypertensive rats. I think you were the one to add to that, Esteban. You are the one with the most yeah. experience in the obese uh, rats. I uh, will try. Yeah, the, the point with, with animal models is, is, is tricky because they don't reproduce properly chronical changes. They mostly focus on mesangial expansion, nodular lesions, and possibly glomerulomegaly, but not chronic 
changes that like could be vest vascular changes. At least I'm talking about animal models of obesity. But I think that exploring other models could be uh, interesting. Just models that hit more the endothelium and the vessels. That that could do. That's that's a good question. It will be interesting to induce obesity in these uh, hypertensive rats, spontaneously hypertensive. That could do. That's a good point. So thank, thank you, you very much to all uh, of you.